and welcome to the Feeling Good Podcast, where you can learn powerful techniques to change the way you feel. I am your host, Rhonda Borowski, and joining me here in the Murrieta studio is Dr. David Burns. Dr. David Burns is a pioneer in the development of cognitive behavioral therapy and the creator of the new teen therapy. He is the author of Feeling Good, which has sold over 5 million copies in the United States and has been translated into over 30 languages. David is currently an emeritus adjunct professor of clinical psychiatry at Stanford University School of Medicine. Hello, Rhonda. Yo, David. Hello. How are you? Good. Hello, Dave. Hi, everybody. <laughs> yes. In addition to me and David, we have a wonderful person with us, Dave Freibush. Um, he does have <laughs> limited technical skills, which are vastly superior to ours, and he's going to be here to make sure everything goes well. And is a, a dear friend and, and neighbor and may uh, just chime in if you feel like it at any point in today's podcast. Yeah, and just to embarrass him further, he's really cute. <laughs> wow, I like being on this podcast already. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I thought I would read one of these really cool endorsements that you've gotten, um, if that's all right with you. It, this is from um, a, li a listener who says, Dear David, hope you're well. I'm now on episode 104 of the podcast, and your podcast and books have impacted my life in a big way. I wanted to share a picture with you that I have attached to this email. This picture was taken while trekking up to the Tiger Monastery in Bhutan. It was nine hours of rigorous trekking while I thoroughly enjoyed listening to your podcasts all through the day. Regards. And what's his first name? His first name is Sushant. Yeah. Well, thank you, Sushant. I just... Loved your email and that wonderful photo, and I'm posting it as the featured photo for today's uh, podcast. I thought it's really neat the way you've got your cell phone showing the little Feeling Good podcast. Uh, what did you say? We haven't said welcome to episode 156. Oh, uh, welcome to podcast 156. <laughs> we'll be, uh, and ask David uh, general questions, but I wanted to thank you for that neat uh, photo, which I posted, and it shows the little uh, on your cell phone the Feeling Good podcast icon, and in the distance you can see this monastery that you've almost arrived at, and I just thought that was so cool and so thoughtful. And I also like the idea that while hiking there toward your enlightenment, you're hiking inwardly with us. Oh yeah, that's great. And that's a great uh, way to look at it. It just meant a lot to me getting, getting that. And thank you all. We get, I got just fa fabulous heartwarming endorsements and and thank you emails pretty much on a daily basis. And we'll, we'll try to read one at the, at the start of each podcast, if, if we can recall, because it really means a lot to us. And also, if you can recommend the podcast to your, to your friends, we would, we would love it. Our, the numbers are, are growing. Uh, we, we hit 90,000 downloads last month which was a new record for us, and you folks are our best source of, of marketing. So if, if you like the Feeling Good podcast, spread the word there for general public and for mental health professionals as well. Yeah, I just had a thought. What if other people took pictures of themselves in really cool parts of the world with a copy of your book? Yeah, or the a, pod, you know, picture of whatever they're reading it on on their technology, and then we could post their pictures on the um Podcast on, on the or, podcast notes. Yeah, awesome. That is really cool. Thank you. Yeah, but it has to be in a really cool place, like, like Sushant's. <laughs> How about if you're just <laughs> no, just in the bathroom? You can't post it. <laughs> going to the bathroom, <laughs> no. taking a poop, reading <laughs> reading my book. I mean, that could be good. No, my, that would not my, be good. <laughs> my, my cat popcorn used to sit on my shoulder when I. Yeah, I know he tells us TMI. <laughs> <laughs> well, today on episode 156, we're doing Ask David questions. So let's start with Anne's question. She says, I loved your podcast. I'm, I'm on the exposure model number 26. But I do have a question. I've suffered from panic attacks for years. The past two years, I've become agoraphobic and don't want to be far away from my house. So my phobia now is having panic attacks. Does that mean I just need to go out and have a bunch of panic attacks in public to get over my fear? The thought seems terrifying. Also, I'm severely claustrophobic, which affects me anytime I feel trapped in elevators, small cars, traffic, tight spaces, etc. Is there a protocol you use to treat patients with this? Just wanted to suggest perhaps a podcast on this subject or agoraphobia, as it does affect many people worldwide. So. Well, that's a great question, and there's a lot of angles to it, and I have a, a story to tell too. 
but let, let me just say that in general team CBT as you know so well around it is not a series of protocols we treat people individually and always start with a daily mood log and so uh, I, I would never treat a panic attack I would only treat the thought that causes the panic attack which would come out on the daily mood log and uh, and then I would have 15 or 20 techniques for for challenging 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 that thought and exposure would only be one of uh, 10 or 20 techniques but for example panic attacks generally result from thoughts like I'm about to to die and in uh, I know Rhonda you've been to my workshops and you've seen my video of uh, a woman with an actual panic attack who who believes she's on the verge of death and she'd had 10 years of panic attacks uh, and failed therapy and during each panic attack she thinks she's on the verge of death because she starts hyperventilating, she gets dizzy, her chest gets tight and she misinterprets this as some sign that she's she's about to die and the technique that worked for her and it took six minutes to get a completely complete cure was simply to have her test the belief I'm about to die by doing strenuous uh, aerobic exercises in, in my office and after a few minutes of uh, jumping jacks it dawned on her that she couldn't possibly be having a heart attack and it ended 20 or 10 years of, of, of panic disorder. You know, it's interesting that you bring up that video because within that video she stops at various points and says, don't, I don't want to go any further, I don't want to go any further, and she starts crying. And when you've shown that video in a training, you've asked the people in the audience, who would stop when she says, who would, what therapist would, would stop when their patient says, I want to stop, and you know, 99% of the people raise their hands, including me. But you had the, you know, what led you to keep going with her? Well, I always push patients when it comes to exposure. You've seen it on the Sunday hikes, too. I say, I want you to talk to this stranger. And they go, oh, I can't possibly do that. I'm too shy. And then I just stop the stranger and say, this person would like to talk to you. And, you know, I push it. I, I make it happen because you have to believe in yourself. and You have to believe in, in, in your patient. And if you back off uh, from, from exposure, uh, that, then it, that the patient gets worse, and backing off is the whole cause of anxiety, anxiety in the first place. But so anyway, that's the general thing. Now, all that ha having been said, uh, one cool way to do exposure for someone with agoraphobia, and this was new about 25 years ago, and I had just heard about it at a conference, so I was eager to try it, but uh, when, when you have someone with agoraphobia, see agoraphobia is the fear of being away from home alone for fear of like having a panic attack in a grocery store or making a fool of yourself or some terrible thing is going to happen. And, and so this woman was really housebound and, and couldn't leave home, home alone for some fear, you know, I can't remember what her fear was. But so what, what I did, and I had a graduate student with me, I think it was Steve... Ristvet, I think, or, or Steve Sayers. I think it was Steve Sayers. And uh, he wanted to see how to do exposure. So he came with me and we told her, we're, we're, we're going to go out. And instead of having you go out and confront, you know, being alone outdoors, we'll go a block and you wait. And then you walk toward us a block. So you'll be alone, but you'll be moving towards safety. Hmm. And she was able to do that. And then we said, now we're going to go two blocks. And then she was able to do that, and we kept going further and further. Were you always within visual range for her? I initially we were, but then eventually we got to you know, a half a mile, and then we, we told her we're, we're going to go a mile, which wasn't at all visual because it was turns and stuff, and, and meet, we'll meet you at the, where they sell lunch trucks, the trucks food near trucks. the university, yeah, the food trucks, and people at lunch go out and they wait in line and they get their cheese whatever Philadelphia what do they call it a cheese a Philly cheese steak? steak yeah cheese steak that's right I never I was in Philadelphia for 20 years I never once ate one of those things <laughs> it just never looked appealing so anyway as we were so she was brave and, and decided to do this so as we were walking uh, with us with a Steve the graduate student he asked for consultation on a patient who'd had a heart attack at work and collapsed on the ground, and his colleagues called 911, and they, the medics came and took him to the hospital, and he was hospitalized, and he, re he recovered. But after that, he had this 
panic that he would uh, have another heart attack and fall on the ground. And he wasn't afraid of death. He wasn't afraid of a heart attack, but he was afraid of looking foolish, that people would look down on him. Yeah. So I said, well, uh, then all you have to do is tell him to go down to Philadelphia during lunchtime or there'd be thousands of people on the sidewalks and just lie down on the sidewalk and that way he can get over his fear <laughs> and people will come and be looking down on him. And you Literally, also, they'd be looking down on him. Yeah, and it, you can also think of it as a, as a shame attacking exercise to, to get over this, this fear. And Steve said, oh, that's a fantastic idea. I'm going to have him do that. And then I said, but of course, you can't ask a patient to do something unless you're willing to do it yourself. And we had just arrived at the food trucks, and there were hundreds of people in line at all these trucks to get their, their lunch. So I said, Steve, I want you to just lie down here on the sidewalk, and then people will have to step over you, you know, to, to get in line and th this type of thing. And he panicked. He said, oh, no, I couldn't do that. The psychology department is right across the street from here, and people might see me and recognize me. And, and I said, you're just whining the way a patient would, and, <laughs> and you, you must do this. Uh, and, and he just get, got real stubborn. It's just interesting how fearful people are of doing the slightest thing that isn't in the mainstream. So he finally said, well, you, well, you do it. So I said, I'll, I'll be glad to. I, said, I lay down on the sidewalk, and it was in the dead of winter, but there wasn't, there wasn't snow on the ground, and, and the sidewalk was actually comfortable. <laughs> and people were just stepping over me. No one gave a damn that I was lying on the, on the sidewalk, and there was a fellow sitting on a stone wall quacking like a duck. <laughs> and nobody paid any attention to him either. And I, I said, this is just like being on the beach in Miami. It's wonderful down here. Lie, lie down with me, Steve. So, so he, he lay down on the sidewalk next to me, and we were kind of discussing cases. It was really, really very pleasant. And then the patient came up and found us lying together on the sidewalk. <laughs> and she was e elated because she had <laughs> defeated her, uh, her agoraphobia. And did she lay down next to you? No, no we, just, we, no, we didn't want to push it that far, but we all went happily back to, to my office. But that, that's yeah, just a great story. One, one, one method, but there are so many ways to, to deal with anxiety. There's the hidden emotion model, the motivational model, and I, and I never like throw a technique at a patient based on, on a diagnosis. But Anne, thank you. I hope you enjoyed the answer to your question. Okay, here's one from Nathan. Nathan wrote, Dear David, love your podcasts. I'm currently preparing a lecture for psychology honor students here at Monash University on assessment of depression and anxiety. In your podcast, you mentioned that you conducted a study on the psychiatric inpatient unit at the Stanford Hospital in which you evaluated how accurate therapists' perceptions of patients were after an interaction. Student researchers interviewed patients for several hours as part of a research study on psychiatric diagnosis. I was wondering if you could provide me with a reference to this study. I, would, I could not find a specific reference in your website, and I would like to be able to highlight to my students the results of your research. Sure. I'll be glad to post the study uh, that, that we published, uh, as well as another independent study that came to the same conclusion. But I want to say that th this was a secondary analysis. The main study was to validate my easy diagnostic system and also to check out a new scale that I had developed on motivation called the willingness scale to see if it predicted recovery from depression on the inpatient unit, which, which, it, which it did. Um, but when I collect data, there, there's uh, two aspects. There's the, the paper you intend to, to publish, but then you have all of this data and you can do additional analyses. I had data on 178 consecutively admitted in, inpatients and I had something like six or seven hundred variables on every one of them. And, and so this, this was just some extra research I was doing to, to find out if the interviewers could correctly assess how depressed, anxious, suicidal, and angry the patients were after a three-hour interview that was totally focused on, on their emotions. And then at the end, I had them turn their back to each other and had the patients fill out my brief mood survey, which asks, how are you feeling at this moment? How, how depressed, how suicidal, how angry, etc." And also, it asked them to rate how empathic the interviewer had been and how helpful the interviewer had been. 
And then at the same time that they were filling it out, I asked the interviewer to fill it out. Now, they didn't know they were being tested on accuracy, which is what made it a good naturalistic study. And the interviewers put, here's how depressed I think this person is, how anxious, how angry, how suicidal, and here's how, I, how empathic I thought I, I was, and here's how helpful I, I thought I was. And then I just looked at the correlations between the two so I could get an estimate of the accuracy of these so-called experts. And everything was un under 10%. Some things were 0% accurate, like the accuracy on, on detecting changes in depression was 3%. Wow. The accuracy on how suicidal the patient was feeling was 0%. The accuracy on anger was, was 0%. The only thing that was helpfulness was 0%. Empathy was 9%. That was the, the most accurate, but that, that was almost completely, completely in, inaccurate. Wow. And the independent uh, publications that I'll list, too, was an independent study of the therapist's view of empathy and the patient's view of empathy, and they came to exactly the same correlation of 0.3, which is 9% therapist accuracy. Oh, that's kind of scary to think how inaccurate therapists can perceive their clients. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and the other thing is that the therapists don't know. There are therapists listening right now, and you probably don't believe it. You probably wrongly think that you are accurate, and, and you're not. Even with the patients, we've seen the same thing in private practice settings where the therapists have worked with patients for months or years, and they, they're, they're still the accuracy is uh, is close to zero. Actually, I had an experience of this just the other day where I was working with a father who was estranged from his 14 or 13 year old son. And I had worked with him for many sessions to get him um, really um, an expert at the five secrets. And I worked with the son a little bit, but then when I felt that the father was really good at doing the five secrets, I got the two of them together. And at their first session, you know, the, the son was throwing all sorts of really painful, difficult questions at the dad. Why did you leave mom? You know, why did this, why'd you do this? Why did you do that? And the dad was just like sh shooting back perfect in five secrets responses. You know, he's doing such a great job with empathy and with him and disarming. And at one point in the session, I said, oh, I, I kind of butted in and said, why don't you try a little inquiry? Because he wasn't asking his son questions or asking how he was, you know, how he was doing. And, um, so, but just for those who aren't familiar, inquiry would be after you respond to your son, then you would say, tell me if I got it right. Tell me more how you've been feeling. I want to hear what it's been like for you to show the interest in the other person. Right. So he didn't do any of that. And I said, hey, try some inquiry. And then at the end of this session, um, you know, they hugged each other and they were making plans for the future. And I was thinking, I am the greatest therapist. <laughs> I crushed it. <laughs> I crushed it. And I, I, can't, I, I was just like feeling so great about myself and feeling great about the two of them. And, and I couldn't wait to see the evaluation of therapy sessions, what patients fill out at the end of the session that gives you the score for empathy. And the highest score is a 20. And I'm hmm. thinking, oh, yeah, he's going to give me a 22 probably. <laughs> <laughs> and um, he only gave me a 15. Yeah, and 15, a 19 is a failing grade, an 18 is a, a bad failing grade, a 17 is a horrible failing grade, and a 15 is Hitler could get a 16. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, my God. <laughs> so I, I was really, actually was really disappointed and a little irritated at him. And, but when I calmed down, I, I, I called him back later that afternoon, and normally I would wait a week or a couple of days, but I wanted to hear immediately what happened. So I, I called him up and said, hey, you know, I was looking over your evaluation of therapy scores and I saw that you gave me a 15 out of 20. And, you know, I, 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 I clearly I failed you in that session. Can you tell me specifically at what point um, I failed you? And he said, yeah, when you asked me, when you interrupted us and you asked me, can you, um, hey, how about some inquiry? You know, that, that impeded our flow and it really got in the way and I kind of got off base and I wish you hadn't done that. And I thought, oh my God, that was such good feedback. But I would never, ever, ever have known yeah. that I made that mistake if he hadn't filled out your form. Two quick points. Number one, that's why we use the brief mood survey and team and, and test patients just before every session begins and just after every session is over and we get empathy ratings at every session and helpfulness ratings. And it's, it's painful because that happens to me all the time too. I, I, I'll think I've had a great session and then I get killed by the patient. But then if, if you're humble the way you were and show an interest 
and, and, and ask the person about it, you can use these as opportunities to deepen, deepen the relationship. Uh, and I've had other sessions where I thought I did terrible. I had one, I, I thought I did so bad I didn't even offer the patient another appointment because I, I was sure she'd never want to come back. And then she contacted me by mail several days later and wrote a, a, a letter saying it was the greatest session we'd ever had. And, and we forgot to schedule, and schedule. And she wants to come back as soon as she can type of thing. And that her depression vanished for the first time a, after that session. And yet I had thought I had done a, a terrible job. But it's, it takes courage to, to have patients rate you. And it takes even more courage to, to review the ratings with them with, with, with humility, but it can transform the quality of your, of your clinical work. Cool. So should we go on to the next question? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So Richard asked, I listened to your podcast on being worthwhile and found it interesting. You say all people are worthwhile. This may be true, but does the whole world think this? If a person is worthwhile, but the world thinks they are not worthwhile, isn't this almost as bad as not actually being worthwhile? Don't we have to play by the world's rules, however bad, instead of our own or the platonic rules? What do you think? Well, that's a great, a great question. <laughs> Richard always asks really, really cool questions and kind of a, with a philosophical Philosophical bad. I have a bunch of ideas on it. Why don't I give you first, uh, first step at this one, if you like, or Dave too. Well, I can only imagine what you are going to say with regard to the question of letting the world's judgment of worthwhile affect one's own belief in their worth, um, yeah. or even if there is such a thing as belief in one's worth. Yeah. Well. Uh, well, we we were talking about this before we started the podcast, and I had said. Well, but people who commit, you know, rapes or, the, you know, shoot people, you know, mass shoot, you know, how can we talk about them being worthwhile? Yeah. Well, um, there, there's just so many cool levels to, to this thing. From, to answer the question the way you put it, Richard, is that other people's judgment of you will never have any effect on you, whether they think you're worthwhile or they think you're worthless. Only your own thoughts could ever possibly affect you. And the thing that drove this home to me was, was something Beck mentioned in the seminar when I was first learning cognitive therapy so many years ago. And I was skeptical too. And, and I was thinking, oh yeah, other people, if they judge you, it, it'll, it'll upset you. But he said, imagine, like, if you walk onto the uh, University of Pennsylvania Hospital psychiatric unit, you get off the elevator, walk onto the, onto the unit, you're, you're visiting or something, and a patient walks up to you and starts shouting that you're the 13th person to get off the elevator, and that proves that you're in league with the devil, and you're the Antichrist, and you're a horrible human being. How, how would you feel? And then I think most people would say, it wouldn't affect me at all because I don't believe what the person is saying. They're they're clearly hallucinating and and, and psychotic. It, it it's certainly sad, but I, I wouldn't I wouldn't take it seriously. And and that that's what we mean when we say you have to buy into a criticism before it can affect how you feel. The second thing is that if if. I, I don't personally take the position that all human beings are worthwhile. My, my position is that it's a meaningless construct. No one can judge your worthwhileness as a human being. It doesn't even mean anything. People can judge, only judge things that you say or things that you do, spe specifics, but not some general notion. Now, let I encourage patients to, to criticize me because then if they're angry, we can, we, we, I can learn from it, see the truth in, in what they're saying and use it to develop a deeper relationship. If you don't respond to a criticism defensively, it can be a tremendous opportunity. And one way to think about it is somebody, let's say they criticize something you said or did. Their criticism can be 100% correct, partially correct, or 0% correct, right? Right. So if it's 0% correct, there's nothing to be upset about. If it's partially correct, then you have something to learn. And, and if it's 
totally correct. You have a whole lot to learn, so you can learn from it, and by listening non-defensively and showing respect and acknowledging the other person's feelings, you can use it to deepen, deepen the relationship. So someone else's judgment or criticism of you could never have any and will never have any effect on you. Only a wrong thought about a criticism or a judgment could, could affect you. So I, I don't know. If yeah, that's and to an answer, answer my own question about how can we view a, like a rapist or a serial oh, killer yeah. as worthwhile, when I worked with convicted sex offenders, that was actually something that we taught that it's not them who's worth worthless, but their actions and their behavior and their thoughts about their actions and behavior needed work, needed to change. But they were still valued as a human being. Yeah. And I imagine if a serial killer, although I'm totally making this up, um, goes to prison, he might find like-minded people who think he's a really great person and think he's worthwhile. Well, I think I, I mentioned to you once that the interview with Je Jeffrey Dahmer, Dahmer or Dahmer or something like that is one of the worst serial killers in American history. And he was, and you can get the interview on YouTube if you like. He was interviewed with his father after he was arrested. I don't remember who the interviewer was, some high level television personality. And he, he, he was, I would say he's the most likable person I've ever seen on television. <laughs> he, wow, that's he hard was, to believe. Yeah, he, he, he was so humble. He, he confessed to, to everything, and he says, I'm not going to blame anybody. My, my parents got divorced, but a lot of my friends' parents got divorced. They didn't turn into serial killers. And he said, I had these fantasies that I was obsessed with, and I started collecting dead animals when I was a little kid, and I loved to cut them apart. And then I, I got to moving on to thinking about humans, and, and then started to do the horrible things I did, and there's no excuse for it, and it's it's horrible, it was wrong. And I don't think I've ever seen anyone who was so humble and so open and honest uh, about his shortcomings. And, you know, I just, I thought he had many, many wonderful qualities, but he had this horrible urge that he that he gave into. And then the oddest thing happened that his father said, well, son, I, I've never told you this before, but when I was little, I had the same fantasies that you had, the same obsessions. It's it just that I, that I didn't act on them. And it was mind-blowing, and you got to thinking maybe it was even genetics, uh, something. And then I got to thinking about how uh, my wife and I, uh, we, we know many serial killers, <laughs> and we love them tremendously. Yeah. Right. Right. They're your cats. Yeah. 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 And and it's it's genetic. They they what they love most is ca capturing and torturing the little little animals. But we don't. It's disgusting. But we don't we don't judge them for it, even even though that activity is 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 is, is, is horrendous. So there's some thoughts about okay. human worthwhileness. Any any anything to add there, Dave? I mean, my. I think it's so interesting how attached we get to a to a term like worthwhile, and we believe that th there's got to be there's got to be something there, and there's a value system attached to it, and yeah. that if we if we let go of it, that we're somehow letting go of our own moral compass it, or something. Yeah. And I think one thing from you know um, getting to know you and 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 how you approach things, just this idea of like yeah, it's a, it is a meaningless it's a meaningless concept, and and once you can see it that way, it really changes. Um, I think it can really change things. I love I love what you're saying, and I think the purpose of therapy, cognitive therapy or team th CBT, see, lot, depression always involves the belief I'm worthless or I'm not as good as I should be, and we're going to do a, some podcasts on that com coming up. And but, but the the goal of therapy is not to decide that you're worthwhile rather than worthless, because that that just puts you under pressure now. But but just to give up the construct completely and, and, to, and to live your, your life. Like, you just happened to drop by, Dave, today to help us out, and that meant a lot to me. We're, we're not winning any electronics competition, but you, you cared enough to come over and help us out because we needed some adjustments on our audio stuff because I'm not very good at it, and Rhonda's got it. My <laughs> level of ineptitude as well. 
uh, but we're, we're not trying to win a contest or become, you know, worthwhile or special. D and does that make any sense? It's just, it's, this is a very rewarding, life is rewarding. Right, life is rewarding in itself. Yeah, and when you don't have to be worthwhile or when you don't have to be special, then life becomes worthwhile, life, life becomes special. But it's easy to say that and it's hard to learn and that's, you know, the Buddha tried to teach people this and they, they couldn't get it 2,500 years ago and it's still hard for people to, to grasp. Right, and sometimes the pursuit of being special or worthwhile prevents us from reaching that goal. Well, the goal of life being special. Well, the goal of ourselves being special. You know, the pursuit yeah. of that sometimes yeah, gets the in the way of, yeah. of our experiencing life as worthwhile and wonderful. Yeah, that's right. That, that, that's exactly right. Well, we'll, we'll do more on that because at the, uh, at the moment we can just hope people consider it as a new idea, maybe. Okay, let's do another one. So Robert asks, Dear David, I am up to podcast 108. I am heading to India next month for a three-week trek, and I'm going to download the rest onto my phone. Perhaps by the time I get back, I will be up to date. I have never heard you mention Tom Zaz, who, as I am sure you know, was making some of the same observations about the constructs of medicalizing you make that you currently make. He made them in the 1960s and maybe in the 1950s. In particular, his criticism of the psychiatric industry giving the names of diseases or syndromes to behavioral issues was very consistent with yours. That's right, and, and uh, Robert is also a friend and a, a journalist and writer. I think he's semi-retired now, but he kindly wrote an article about me for Stanford Magazine, oh, neat. which came out about five years ago, and I think at the time was the most read article in the history of the magazine, because they, they track it online. And so I'm really indebted for the, the, the wonderful job that, that you did, Robert. You're absolutely right. Uh, Thomas Saws, you, you can all, I link to him on the show notes. By the way, if you listen to the show notes on my feeling good, if you go and listen there, you can get the, the show notes if you sign up for the, the podcasts. I think you can get them on Facebook too, and maybe on, on, on Twitter. Uh, but at any rate, I put a lot of work into the show notes to enhance the uh, podcast, and I put a link, the Wikipedia link, but he wrote a book called The Myth of Mental Illness. Thomas Saws, S-Z-A-S-Z, -S and caused a, a controversy claiming that there's no such thing as, as mental illnesses. Well, he was primarily right, but not to totally right. There are several true mental illnesses that are biological disorders, like schizophrenia is one, and uh, bipolar one, full-blown manic depressive illness where people get manic and psychotic uh, that's a true brain disorder as well. But most of what's in the DSM is just norm, normal human suffering that's been, as Robert say, says, medicalized. So instead of telling you that you're shy, or uh, you have social anxiety, they say you have social anxiety disorder. Well, most people worry, but then if you go to the psychiatrist and say, well, you have generalized anxiety disorder, it makes it sound like these are brain disorders as opposed to just feelings that some people have more of and some people have less of. The feelings exist, but these brain disorders do, do not exist. They're just fantasies. But what they do is, is they allow the psychiatrist to, to treat you like, quote, a patient. So then he, can per, he or she can prescribe drugs rather than talking to you and doing psychotherapy and, and, and helping you solve that problem. Uh, psychopharmacology to prescribe when I was my I used to be a psychopharmacologist it only took me one minute to handle the medication at the beginning of a session and then if that's all you do you, you can actually schedule five or ten minute drug sessions just what's the dose do you have any side effects you need a refill on your prescription and if that's if that's all you do, you can make millions because you can get paid. Like in this part of the country, I think you can get paid like something like two hundred dollars for a ten minute medication checkup. Wow! And so if you have you know ten of those an hour, six of those an hour, that's twelve fifteen hundred dollars an hour. And, wow! And yet, what people need is someone to show them how to get over their shyness, how to improve their marriage, or or whatever uh, whatever the problem is. So. I, I, you just make a great point, 
uh, Robert, and I, I, I agree with you. Okay, let's do one more. This is a fun one. Robert also asks, my other question is an idea for future podcasts, and it is. How about critiquing the therapeutic approach we see so often on television and in the movies? For the lay audience, these are probably the source of much of what they know about therapy. And because these therapists are well-known and fictional, it would give you an opportunity to make critiques without having to criticize an actual person. And it could introduce some levity into what can often be quite heavy. Some of the Hollywood therapists people know best are Judd Hirsch as the shrink in the movie Ordinary People, Lorraine Bracco as the shrink in the TV series The Soprano, The Sopranos, Peter Bogdanovich as the shrinks 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 shrink in The Sopranos, Billy Crystal as the shrink in Analyze This, Robin Williams in Good Will Hunting, Kelsey Framer, Kelsey Grammer in Frasier. I'm sure there are others. These are the ones who quickly came to mind. I found an article about this that might help make the case about what the public sees on TV and in the movies is not really reflective of the therapeutic process or of good therapy. And I'm sure David will post the link on his um, podcast notes. Well, I'll be quick and see what you folks think on this one, but I love the question and it's, it, it's true on two different levels. The, the only ones of these I've seen, saw, seen was the Ordinary People and then Goodwill Hunting. And I just love those movies but but they they do have this idealistic view of therapy that's so radically different from from what I do that that there you know you it's a long drawn out process of talking and then after I know in Robin Williams and Goodwill Hunting and he's working with this sociopathic brilliant good looking rebellious fellow uh, and then it's some point Robin Williams mentions that his wife farted in the middle of the night and that's when he realized he was deeply in love with her and somehow this is very meaningful to the, his patient and they they hug and sob together and you know they have him <laughs> open up and and stuff like that and I mean I, I I love that stuff but it's it's just so radically different from how how we work in team CBT which is I like to sit down with someone for a double session and, and try to complete the therapy or make their symptoms go away quickly, you know, whenever possible. And we assign homework and the idea is to get a, a rapid and, and lasting lasting result. The one other point is, is that the link talks about how neurotic mental health professionals are. And this has been a joke of our culture for a long time, and I think it's really true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm impressed by the by how many of your podcast listeners are going trekking in uh, in the yeah. Himalayas <laughs> listening to your podcast. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I want to add one other one other. Uh, I think everybody should uh, search in their YouTube for the for the Bob Newhart episode called "Stop It," and then you'll see what is a really really funny um, yeah. therapist example. Yeah, we forgot about good old Bob Newhart. <laughs> yeah. Well, David. How about telling us what workshops you have coming oh, up? Oh yeah, thank you. I forgot about that. There's there's two, uh, the uh, workshops, the intensives, the four day Calgary intensive and the four day San Francisco intensives had the highest ratings for an intensive in 25 years or more, and so I think hopefully the Atlanta Georgia one from November 4 to 7, 2019 will be as good. And if you go to my uh, website, feelinggood.com, and click on the workshop tab, you, you'll find all the registration information. Actually, you, Dave, came to one. All, the, all the, In fact, the way we met each other is Dave came to my workshop in Vancouver, and we met there and then found out we live like three or four blocks from, from each other. <laughs> oh, and, uh, that was a great, that was a great workshop. Yeah. They're, the intensives are, are wonderful if you want to really... Uh, change the way, way you practice and learn learn a lot of new techniques and do personal work too. Uh, and then I, I have a one-day workshop with my dear colleague, uh, Dr. Jill Levitt, on October 6, 2019, on um, Advanced Empathy Tools for Connecting with Challenging Patients, Colleagues, Friends, and Loved Ones. And again, you can get information on my website, feelinggood.com. Go to the uh, workshop tab, and then you can get all the registration inf information. If you want to attend that one, I would move fast because it, they they always sell out. There's, there's about 45 who can come in person, and the rest 
are online and we have a lot of helpers for the online people so you have a wonderful uh, experience and small group, group exercises and mentoring and, and, and such but if you want to come in person uh, move, move move quickly okay well thank you so much for everyone dave for being here david for great. a really interesting podcast thank Any you final thank you okay see you later this has been another episode of the feeling good podcast for more information visit dr burns website at feelinggood.com where you will find the show notes for this episode under the podcast page you will also find archives of previous episodes and many resources for therapists and non-therapists. We welcome your comments and questions. If you want to support the show, please share the podcast with people who might benefit from it. You could also go to iTunes and leave a five-star rating. The theme music is Gypsy Jazz in Paris, 1935, composed and performed by Brett Van Donzel. I am your host, Rhonda Borowski. We hope you enjoyed this episode. I invite you to join us next time for another episode of the Feeling Good Podcast.